Um, I, should I start off by telling my Benton Lash story? I feel like I shouldn't go first. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, all right. So uh, my name is Anina Bennett. I am a writer and a recovering comic book editor. Um, I, many years ago, I worked at First Comics, um, which some of you may remember, the originally earlier version of First Comics, not the version they tried to bring back. Uh, and <laughs> yay, somebody's going yay first in the background. Um, this was in the late 1980s when I started there. And um, a lot of people don't know that First Comics, although it was a trailblazer in independent comic book publishing, did not have truly creator-owned comics. That company actually owned the rights to most of the books they published, which included Grimjack, Nexus, and several other books that went on to have new life at other publishers. Um, so this part of their business model actually was problematic for a lot of creators. And so the way, the way I met Batten first was right around this time, um, he was doing uh, what's now called Supernatural Law, was a comic strip called Wolf and Bird, Counselors of the Macabre, and it wasn't running as its own comic book yet. And I was familiar with it mainly because I had, I had a job copy editing a legal newspaper in Chicago, hmm. uh, which is an arcane thing to do, and his strip actually ran in the National Law Journal. And I'm pretty sure that's how I was first exposed to it. And as the Grimjack editor, I also had the opportunity to do a one-shot special of Munden's Bar, which if, if you've ever read Grimjack, you know that it takes place in a pan-dimensional city where the dimensions are constantly going in and out of phase with each other, written by the great John Ostrander. Um, and Munden's Bar is the bar that Grimjack owns and where he hangs out, and so all kinds of crazy crap goes down in Munden's Bar. Um, so I wanted, they had done a, previously done a Munden's Bar special before I started working there. I wanted to do one, but get people who actually owned their own characters to be able to do them because there was this huge wave of creator-owned independent stuff coming out at the time that was really fun and really interesting and very different from the superhero comics I had grown up on. So uh, I had to go through, I had jumped through a lot of hoops at First Comics to get them to draft new contracts for this book and Batten Lash was one of the people that I really wanted to get in here because I thought supernatural lawyers in Sinisher in London's bar, like there's got to be something awesome that's going to come out of that. Um, and it was. He did a story that I still think of every time I read a contract because the title of the story was For All Perpetuity and Throughout the Universe, <laughs> which is a phrase you will actually see in some contracts and mm -hmm. you should object to it if you see it in a contract. Um, so this was, a, this was an amazing project. Uh, it's one of the first comic book appearances of his characters as opposed to comic strips. Um, and it also, this issue actually also has a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles story in it, because mm. first had the rights to their first collection. Um, so it may be a little bit expensive to buy it, um, but it's also got all these great people like Omaha the Cat Dancer and a bunch of other people. And then Batten and I first met when this was in production or right after it had come out um, at the Chicago Comic Con, and that is gonna come back in a story that Jackie Estrada is gonna tell a little bit later, I think. Um, and he just would, I think other people have a lot of uh, memories to share about him, um, so I don't want to, I don't want to jump the gun, uh, but I'd like to start bringing up uh, other people to, to talk about Batten Lash. We're first going to go through the people who were on the panel, who many of whom worked with him or knew him closely, um, and then if anybody else in the audience has uh, memories that they'd like to share or just your feelings about his work or anything like that, we'll, uh, we'll give you as much time as we have. Scott, would you like to begin since you're already up here? And when and everybody uh, who was on the panel, if you could briefly introduce yourself, just say say your name and uh, and then tell your story. Let's see if we can get this over to you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Scott Shaw. I'm a guy that does funny stuff, I guess. <laughs> and uh, and so was Bat, but he was he he did a lot of different things other than that. Uh, I I. Jackie, what year was it the bat came out first time? I know I met him at the community concourse. Um, well, the first time he came to San Diego was 89. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's, that's where I met him. And it seems like a couple of years later he had a, a, an episode for the lawyer newspaper. And that's where we really got to know each other because he came to me and he said, I'd like you to letter my strip. I, I've got to get it in and nobody else can do it. And I thought, I'm not a letterer. I'm you know, mediocre at best. But uh, that's how Bat and I kind of became friends. And uh, we, uh, we like, you know, I'm about the same age. Uh, definitely both, you know, steeped in comic book uh, arcane information and background. So uh, it was kind of interesting. Ultimately, both of us wound up working on Radioactive Man, which is kind of a comic that was about all comic book history, all warped through the 
eye of the Simpsons universe. But, you know, Bat was, uh, he was very serious about being a professional cartoonist. I, and this really has nothing to do with it, but I, I have no idea how much money he was making from the comic. I can't imagine that much, because none of us were. But Bat would have an assistant. He had an office downtown San Diego. He was like, you know, I mean, we always refer to him as the gentleman cartoonist. But I mean, it was almost like, it wasn't obsessive, but he... You know how everybody who's talked about Dave Stevens was born like 30 years too late because Dave had been perfect in the pulp era? Bat always kind of had that... What, you know, Howard Chaikin would disagree, but, it, it, you know, looking at the old days, we assume that everybody was a little more genteel and nice toward each other in the business back then. We know otherwise, but we'd like to think that way. And Bat was really kind of, to me, an example of uh, uh, one of the classic cartoonists that just a lot of people hadn't really waken, woken up to his stuff yet. But uh, we would, we would uh, back to the notion of uh, the uh, funny book... Uh, minutia that we would stick in our stories, we would get long conversations because that was kind of the era where, like that comic 1963 that Alan Moore did that was kind of a parody of early Marvel. Everybody was doing nostalgia and we liked nostalgia, but he would always warn me, he says, nostalgia is the laziest form of writing. He said, you're trying to appeal to something that people already like. So he said, if we can warp it in a way that says something, then that's a different story. And I really like the fact that we could actually have deep conversations about stuff that was so silly and disposable. But Bat was, Bat was the real thing and he really took his cartooning seriously and I will always miss him. I was so lucky I had to be in San Diego in September and I got together with him and Jackie and I was very glad I could at least yuck it up with Bat one last time. I didn't realize he was in the trouble he was and you know it kind of came on really fast but uh, I'm glad I got to see see Bat in, in relatively good shape and, and himself, and I'll always have that memory. Thank you for taking me out to dinner that night. Thank you, Scott. Um, I think we have Rob Salkowitz uh, in the audience. Rob, I would love it if you could, um, in addition to whatever stories you want to tell about Bat, give us a little bit of context for the person we're talking about. Who was he and, and what was he all about in his work? Sure, uh, thank you. Um, so my name is, is Rob Salkowitz. I'm basically a, a sayer and writer of things about comics. I write about the business of comics and entertainment for Forbes, and I've written books and other things about this. And as a person of the written word, I've saved probably most of my best lines about that for the written piece that's in the back of your San Diego Comic Fest programs. Um, so not to repeat myself on that, that kind of tells the story of, of how we met. Um, that when I first started coming to San Diego Comic-Con in 1997, I was, uh, you know, I was doing my, my work as a, as a business consultant and a writer, and I was separately a huge comics fan and into all of this stuff. And it is really because of the kindness and the welcoming nature of Batten and Jackie that we found ourselves getting deeper into the community that we all share here. And that I got to know people and I got to um, learn things and make connections and be able to eventually turn my passion for all of this stuff into my professional work. It is absolutely a, a dream to have, you know, finally gotten to be what I wanted to be when I grew up. Um, and I owe a, a huge amount of that to Patton and Jackie. Um, but separately from that, what, what appealed to me beginning, uh, you know, in addition to, to his written personality, I encountered Patton first through his work. Um, his, Wolfenbird was being serialized in Comic Buyer's Guide in the 1990s. And I was kind of an old-time comic fan that had been out of comics. I had not been paying attention to comics for uh, since, like, from 1983 to 1996. And those of you may remember what was going on in superhero comics in 1996 and that era was really designed to make sure people like me were not going to be readers. Like the art style, the storytelling style, a lot of the stuff that was, that was popular at that moment was really not, uh, um, didn't, didn't sit well to my eye and to my storytelling sense. And then I would read Supernatural Law and some of the related work and the way that he 
used this very deceptively simple drawing style that had echoes of you know, Archie Comics and Steve Ditko and Will Eisner and all of these great storytellers, that, a tradition that he had really internalized and made his own. And he combined it with these really clever, witty stories that not only had all of the Silver Age, you know, like the, the nostalgia and the, the little bits of funny book lore and all that stuff, but a genuine warmth to the characters that made you want to come back and wonder what was going to happen to these characters next? What was their, in, within their relationships with each other? And that's what kept us coming back month after month, reading the strips, reading the comic books, um, and coming back uh, to them. So for those of you in the audience um, who, have, who did not have the privilege of meeting Batten and chatting with him and experiencing, you know, his uh, his joie de vivre, and of course his legendary fashion sense, and all of the things that we love about that personally. Lucky for us, his work lives on, and you can get a real flavor for the storyteller he was and the man he was from reading that work. Thank you, Rob. Very well said. And Rob writes a lot of really interesting um, stuff for mainly for Forbes, um, but he's very got, got an amazing brain for analysis and everything that you said about uh, Bat's work. I think is probably what I responded to when I was a twenty-something editor at First Comics. But I was twenty-something. I would not have been able to articulate it that way uh, at the time. But it was definitely the clear storytelling and that slightly you might call it old-fashioned uh, approach and the warmth of the characters was definitely all part of what I responded to. Um, so I believe we also have, uh, Mark, or, Mark, do you want to say, you're not officially on the panel, but you should talk. Yeah, you are willing to come up and say something. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Mark Evanier. Thank you. Um, you know, it's silly, I think, for us to keep talking about what, how great Bat was. You all know this. There's nobody here who has to be convinced that Bat was a great. Is there anyone here who has to be convinced that Bat was a great guy? We'll double team. All right. Okay. Let's all go jump this woman and tell her what a great guy Bat was. Um, I'm going to repeat a little bit of what I said at the first Bat Memorial. I'm going to say this at every Bat and Lash Memorial, and we should have a lot of them, actually, because I don't want to turn loose of this guy so soon. Uh, I have this very, very great anger at cancer. Mm -hmm. I don't like cancer. I don't want to offend anybody here who's a big fan of it. I really hate it. It keeps taking away people I wanted to have in my life. And a lot of you know I have a great friend named Carolyn who I lost to cancer two years ago. And the last time Carolyn was well enough to go to Comic-Con in San Diego, which was maybe six, seven years ago, she insisted on bringing along some friends of hers who were not into comics. She, she had this childhood friend she wanted to have see it. She'd known this one for 60 years, and the woman's husband, and they brought them to Comic-Con. People who were not interested in comic books or animation or science fiction or anime or all the stuff that we all know. They, they didn't even know what the word cosplay meant. They were dressed like human beings. <laughs> and they went around the convention for three or four days and looked at everything, and at the end of it, they came and said, thank you, Mark, for helping us get to Comic-Con. And I said, what did you enjoy about this? If you're not interested in this stuff, why did you like Comic-Con so much? And Sue, the woman, said to me, it was the most exciting weekend of my life because everywhere we looked, there was someone who had made something. Everywhere you looked, someone had done a painting, someone had written a book, someone had made a sculpture, someone had, had built something out of Lego blocks you couldn't understand, whatever it was, there was creativity everywhere you looked. And this was new to these people, those of us who work in comics and draw and write and paint or whatever we do, we may be a little jaded about being around creative people because we're around them all the time. It was exciting for them. And they started telling me things they found around the dealer's room that just excited them. And they said, we found this one guy sitting there. He had, was selling a comic book that he had done himself. He had written and drawn himself. Do, do you know that guy? And I said, that's like half the convention. <laughs> I can't possibly think about who that was based on that. And they said, well, he was very well dressed. I thought, back to the machine. <laughs> and he was talking, he said, we bought this comic book of his, and he was so nice and so polite and so, and he just, he seemed very passionate about it. He was very proud of it, but he wasn't conceited about it. And we went and we read the comic book that night, and uh, we, 
loved it. And we went back to talk to him the next day. And you know this guy? I said, yeah, the comic book you bought was called Supernatural Law. And she said, no, that wasn't it. But we went back. I said, no, it was super. It was Bat and Lash's comic. If he was well dressed, it was Bat and Lash. <laughs> it was Supernatural Law. And they said, no, it wasn't that. But we went back, and he was talking to us about, about look at how much thought this man and how much care he put into the work. We just loved it. I said, it was supernatural law. She said, no, it wasn't. She said, I got it here. She took out her book. She said, no, it was called Wolf and Bird. <laughs> OK. <laughs> anyway, and what it, it occurred to me that that was a perfect example of the kind of creator that I just I respect and love that we have around, the organic one. That studied at the feet of people like Harvey Kurtzman. And he studied the work of people like Steve Ditko and, and Will Eisner and all those people. And he knew a lot of these people. But you don't look at his work and see, oh, he's copying them. <coughs> he understood what they did, and he made it his own. He took the philosophy behind it, filtered it through his own creativity, and came out with a unique product. There is no comic that looks like his work except his work. Everything he did was very fresh and interesting, and I'm very annoyed that we are robbed of the stuff he was going to do in the future. Because as good as it was, he was just getting better and better and better. And I resent the fact that I don't get to have that lash in my conventions, and I can't go see him, and I'm angry about this, and we all should be angry about this, and I wish there was something we could do about it. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. I love that uh, you sent people out onto the convention floor and they and uh, they came back and that was one of their favorite, uh, their absolute favorite things. And I want to put a couple of things in context. Um, people often talk about Bat uh, as being Bat and Lashes, having been very well dressed, having an amazing uh, fashion sense, and he used to wear a lot of um, vintage type stuff. And part of the reason that that stood out so much is that, especially at the time, not a lot of people dressing up at Comic Cons. But he was always the guy. He was always there. He always, and it wasn't even about that he was vain about it. Although maybe Jackie can speak to that better than I can. Um, it was just that he enjoyed it. He just liked to dress up, and and you know, and he liked to look that way. Uh, and the, one of What's that? He even used to <laughs> um, So uh, now I'd like to bring up somebody who, uh, every time I see him, has got some kind of interesting article of clothing on, uh, looking very, very genteel today, Arlen Schumer. Hmm. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm an um, illustrator who works in a comic book art style, and I'm also a pop culture and comic book historian. I lectured on Starango's Captain America, yesterday and last night on Steve Ditko, Batten's favorite. Keep that in mind, I'll mention something about that later. And then um, tonight I'll be lecturing on The Twilight Zone and tomorrow on Neil Adams' Batman. And these were all favorites of Batten's as well, which gets me to my Batten Lash. The year is 1976. I'm attending my fourth Phil Suling New York comic convention. He's the guy that started it all, the direct market. Anybody go to the Phil Suling July 4th conventions. Are you all West Coasters that didn't make the schlep? <laughs> Oy vey. Okay, hmm. where was I? So, there I am, and, and at the conventions, the way they kicked off, it was the Commodore Hotel, which is now the Grand Hyatt, right next to the Grand Central Station. Have you at least visited New York City? <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> California, it must be that nice that you don't even go back to the East Coast. You don't know what you're missing. Okay, but I digress. Okay, so there I am. So it was big hotel, Commodore Hotel, and um, they had always a keynote speaker to kick off the four-day convention, and um, it was always over July 4th, and it was a big room for the keynote convention, and I'm sitting there, and there's a dais with you know the keynote speaker. I don't remember who it was. Why don't I remember anything about the 1976 comic convention? Because maybe three rows in front of me, and this is a packed crowd, lights on, daytime, three rows in front of me is the most famous, popular, greatest comic book artist, my childhood idol. I won't name names, but it rhymes with Neil Adams. Hmm. <laughs> he and Jeanette Kahn, the brand new publisher of DC Comics, who had just replaced Carmen Infantino, <laughs> I can say this because it took place in public. I know it happened. They're making out 
right there, in three rows in front of me, like two, what's the cliche, like two kids necking in the back of the theater when it's dark? They're making out passionately. Now listen, I was an 18 year old virgin. I never made out with a girl until I got to college. And they're doing this right in public and the speaker is speaking and people are paying attention and they're making out like this way while everything's happening this way. I couldn't believe it. It's that memory seared its way into my brain. And I don't remember anything else. I think I blacked out the rest of the convention. Anyway, flash forward, it's 1992. I'm living in New York City. Oh, no, I'm sorry, I just moved out of New York City. But I go back in to um, go to a great little art gallery on the Lower East Side called Max Fish. And um, very kind of funky, cool place. And I meet this guy, Batten Lash. Now, first of all, I thought my name, Arlen, was fairly unique. Batten Lash? Bat Lash? Yeah, there's a comic book, Bat Lash. Well, obviously, one word led to another, and we start sharing stories about our comic book background, and I mean, we shared so much stuff. I'm looking at this guy. First of all, I thought he was Jewish. He just had that New York Jewish thing, and of course, he wasn't Jewish, and it, I just couldn't believe, and I feel like I met my brother from another mother because we just shared so much. We came out of the same pop culture primordial soup. You know what I mean? That we're all, we all come out of. But everything I said, you know, Neil Adams, and ba ba da 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 And I think I had just done the cover of the National Law Journal, where I treated lawyers like superheroes. So I had legal eagle and, you know, stuff like that. And, uh, and because Batten had um, Wolf and Bird in National Law Journal, I think that's what kicked off the conversation. But since we shared so much of the same pop culture background, and I think we have been talking about Neil Adams, I said, Batten, let me ask you something. And I told him about the 1976 incident. And Batten goes, Arlen, I was there. And that obviously <laughs> cemented our bromance. <laughs> and then, just like when you're a teenager and you know your male friends get a girlfriend and the girlfriend takes them away, he meets Jackie. <laughs> hmm. Well, he, they had already met, but my point is, right after Batten and I had this bonding over this Neil Adams incident, he moves to San Diego. And I'm living in Connecticut. And basically, like a guy that I felt like was my brother and the mother was taken away from me. Like that old fashioned thing when you're a teenager. But, why for the next how many years after that? It's 992. For the next 26, 7 years? Why did I never resent that? And why was I able to keep up a great relationship with Batten? Yeah, I'd only physically see him every year at San Diego Comic Con, or when they'd come to New York, or, you know, we'd email, call, you know, the usual stuff. But I really felt like, you know, had we physically remained close, you know, you can only really build real friendships when you spend physical time. But I never resented it, and I always was comfortable with it, because I knew Batten was in great hands, that he had met his soulmate, and that the love they shared, and the bond they shared, was something that those of us who don't have that in our lives, is something beautiful. And the love that they had, and everybody who knows them knows, about the love I'm talking about. So, when Batten passed away, um, the first image that came to mind is that I have to draw something. And I said, uh, he loves Steve Ditko. I mean, that was one of the, you know, first or second or third things we, we talked about. So I turned Mr. A into Mr. B, and I lifted a Steve Ditko you know, image, and I showed it last night. And um, um, I you know, posted it and I sent it to uh, Jackie, she really liked it. And then a couple weeks ago at the New York version of this memorial, um, at the Society of Illustrators, I get there and I pick up the program book and on the back of the little memorial program, Jackie put my image, so I was very honored by that. And I just wanna say, Batten, I love you, I miss you. You're still my brother from another mother, I wish we could have had 27 years worth of physical closeness, but you were still my brother from another mother. I love you and I miss you. Thank you, Jackie.
Thank you, Ellen. Um, I'm trying not to cry right now. Um, Baton Lash and Jackie Estrada were fixtures at many conventions for many years, and if you've gone to San Diego Comic Con, you probably would have seen them there every year for many years in the same spot. If you've never self-published a comic book, you may not know just how much work goes into that, into all the stuff that you see on the booth, and everything. There's, I can't even tell you how all-consuming it is. It's so all-consuming, I had never want to self-publish anything in my life, and I am absolutely, I've always been in awe of people like Batten and Jackie who really get it done and keep doing it. That is the hardest part, to keep committed to it and keep doing it year after year after year, and that's, that is something to be really proud of. Um, you guys were amazing, you were always there. Batten was always turning out the work. I mean, one of the only other people I can think of who's like that is Stan Sakai, who's at this show, who if you have not met, go talk to him in the dealer's room. Um, but with that, Jackie, if you would like to come up and say something. Well, Ani now talked about the 1990 Chicago Comic Con, and that is where Bat and I actually met. Um, and I would say it was actually Will Eisner that brought us together, even though Will was not at that show. Um, in 1990, I edited the souvenir book for Comic Con, and uh, I got it to the printer and, you know, big deadline off my mind and I was talking to Faye Desmond and she said she was going to go to Chicago to go to Chicago Comic Con, not to represent Comic Con or anything, but because she was going to help out uh, Bob Chapman at the graffiti booth. And I said, can I go with you? And she said, sir, sure. So, you know, kind of a last minute thing, July 4th weekend, went with Faye to the Chicago Comic Con. So DC had a party one night, and so I was sitting there at a table eating, and this guy comes and taps me on the shoulder, and he said, are you Jackie Estrada? And I said, yes. And he said, oh, uh, my name's Baton Lash. Uh, I just want to thank you for using my piece of artwork in the souvenir book this year. Um, he had gone to his first San Diego the um, year before, and even though we had been in the same places at the same time, we had never met. But in 1990, it was the 50th anniversary of the Spirit. And so we had had that as a theme in the souvenir book. Will Eisner had been Bat's teacher at the School of Visual Arts. And so he had sent in a Spirit uh, tribute piece, and I had accepted it. And I always send out a little postcard saying, got your piece of art that's going to be in there. So. He said, I got your postcard and I really like that, thank you. So as the evening went on, um, Faye and I would keep passing that and his best friend Russell Calabrese, you know, and just kind of getting little passing conversations. And then as the weekend went on, uh, we would run into them and, you know, I was, I call them the Bobs, Bob Chapman, Bob Shrek, um, uh, I can't remember who the third Bob, but they, they were always in the bar ordering blue drinks. So we were making these jokes about the Bobs and their blue <laughs> drinks and things. And so I got in a conversation with Bad about Steve Ditko. And uh, I said, you know, I have some original Steve Ditko artwork. And like, you know, because like, he didn't even know women who read comics, much less who knew Steve Ditko, well, much less had a five page Ditko story from pre. Uh, superhero Marvel. Hmm. So this was five weeks before the San Diego Con that year. And he said he and his friend Russell and, and his friend Mitch and some other people had uh, decided to come to San Diego for the whole week. So they had gotten a suite at the, the um, Hotel San Diego. Right. Yeah. Uh, and they were coming in on Sunday. And so, you know, I get home from that trip and I I, I really liked that guy, so I kept finding excuses to calm him up. Uh, you know, um, you know this chocolatier in Manhattan, it's called Toyser Chocolates. They have this one kind of chocolate you can't get anywhere else, and it has this little thin thing of toffee in it. And if you happen to go in Manhattan, 
you know, could you get a box for me and bring them to San Diego and then I'll meet up with you and I'll get the chocolates from you. <laughs> um, and so he would tell his friend, Mitchell, oh, Jeff, you just try to call me. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, she's just a nice person, you know, and we, we have nice chats. Oh, really? <laughs> so then, you know, they all came into town. It was a Sunday. And so Faye and I some, and some other people said, well, Welcome to San Diego, let's all go out to dinner. So we went to the Panda Inn in Horton Plaza. And when everybody mm -hmm. went to sit down, Bat went to sit down and Mitch rearranged the chairs so that I would be sitting next to Bat. <laughs> and, and Russell was kind of oblivious because he started to sit down there and Mitch like pushed him away. <laughs> <laughs> and then the, the other thing I did was um, at my house, I had a Tuesday night uh, kind of barbecue that I invited the guys that had all come uh, ahead of time, and Comic-Con people, and Dennis Kitchen, and various other people were there. But this was an excuse to get him to my house, so I could show him my Ditko original art. <laughs> so that sealed the deal. By the end of the week, we were a couple. And I, either Friday or Saturday night was the 50th anniversary spirit party um, that Dennis Kitchen threw. And so at the party, mm -hmm. Will is there, and Bat and I go up to talk to him, and he looks at his student, Bat and Lash, and his Eisner Awards administrator, Jackie Estrada, is like, I approve. <laughs> Thank you, Jackie, so much for sharing some of your memories and that amazing story about uh, your your courtship. I love that you uh, you invited him up to see your etchings. <laughs> <laughs> um, Arlen invoked the, uh, the the New York, the East Coast, West Coast um, split, and one thing that's missing from this is uh, Batten's wonderful accent. Um, and I can't, I'm not going to try to uh, mimic it, except there was one word I used to try to get him to say to me all the time. Coffee. <laughs> um, so we have some time. Is there anyone in the audience who uh, who would like to come up and share something? James, we don't have a wireless mic, unfortunately. I don't think my cord's long enough. Hi, I'm James Hudnall. I'm a writer of comics for over 30 years and a friend of Batten's. I've known Batten. The first time I met Batten was in 89, but uh, I really had my first conversation with him. It was a decent conversation. In 94, I guess, I had a booth at Comic Con I was promoting my self publishing company, which was Halloween Comics at the time. And he and I just had a really good chat because he was in a booth. He and Jackie were in a booth, like about three booths down. And then it wasn't until uh, 2009 when I moved back to San Diego. I had gone up to uh, Portland area for a startup company. I'm, I'm an IT person as well as a comic writer. And unfortunately, that company didn't get any funding because it was a financial crisis. So I was stuck up there for two years. And I, my life was sort of like a uh, Charles Dickens novel from then on. You know? So when I came back to San Diego, I had to live with my sister and my mom for a while, and I was pretty dejected because financially I couldn't get work for a couple of years and as a programmer. So um, I, but I would, I'm oh, sorry. So I would, uh, anyway, Batten and Jackie uh, got in touch with me and they sort of helped me reintegrate with the comics community and everything. And I used to go to lunch with Batten uh, once a month and he had this really cool office in downtown in the street that was sort of like a Dashiell Hammett detective office in the 30s, this is an old building. And we would go out and we would just commensurate about comics and TV shows we liked and all this other stuff. And it was just great because it was talking to somebody who had the same general experience where we were close in age. He's a little bit older, but we both loved the same things growing up. We both loved Kirby and Ditko and all that stuff. And DC Comics, we knew, he knew about stuff that I didn't know and I knew stuff he didn't know. So we were just trading stories about the industry and our experiences. But one of the things that connected us was we were both 
kind of outsiders in the comics industry because although I've done mainstream comics, I always consider myself more of an independent self-publisher. From the beginning, I just wanted to do my own thing. I never really wanted to get into comics to write the Hulk or something. That was never my intention. I wanted to be like my hero Kirby, who was a creator. I wanted to create new stuff. And Batten, he was kind of an outsider because despite his talent, he could never get really looked at at the major companies. Marvel gave him a one-shot book, which was sort of a fluke, but that's the closest he ever got to that. Yeah, Mark Heath meets the Punisher. That was the only thing he got to do. And that was the biggest thing, I guess, in terms of, you know, overall exposure. But um, he, uh, you know, so we, we sort of understood that and we both had similar experiences where, but we both weren't big drinkers. I mean, Mike drink a, one drink at a social thing or maybe he would drink more than me, but not that much. So we just both kind of found that if you don't drink a lot, then a lot of people won't hang out with you. Stuff like that, you know, just stuff that you that we had in common that we learned. But you know, we're both also the same kind of temperament. I mean, he was much more gregarious than me. But um, you know, we both and we both had similar kind of backgrounds in terms of our like I had different life growing up than he did because I was all over the West Coast and he was mainly just in Brooklyn. But we had similar kind of upbringings and parents and stuff. And uh, so we just we just had a lot in common. But the main thing is is that we had a similar views on things as far as we were kind of politically agnostic. We didn't really believe in political parties that much, and uh, we and that makes you at variance with a lot of people in comics who are more progressive. I mean, we just we have our own kind of and we didn't hate anyone, and we get along with people on both sides really of the you know because we just like people. Uh, and that's another thing, and, and that's one of the great things about Batten is that he was a very, he was a person that people liked, no matter where you came from. He was somebody who could connect with you personally on any level, um, and he was like a special kind of person. There's, there's not people like him are very rare in this world, you know, and a lot of people can understand and relate to that that know him. Um, but also, he was a, a real a talent that should have been. Res appreciated more. I know that, uh, I mean, he is appreciated by a lot of people, but I think he's somebody who deserves more of a appreciation than he got. But nonetheless, he's loved, which is, I think, you know, it's probably the biggest reward than, than fame, is having people care about you. Thank you, James. Um, a lot of people have mentioned uh, things that we had in common with Bab, love of Steve Ditko, um, you know, love of dressing nicely. One of the things I really always admired about him so much is that another way in which he was a rare person is you could disagree with each other, or you could disagree with Bat about something political or something that other people might get to a huge, you know, friendship killing fight about, but still be friends with him. And that today is even more of a rarity when I first met him, I think, and we need more of that in the world. Um, is there anybody else who would like to share anything about Bat's work or their experiences with him? Oh, by the way, you have to hold this mic really close to your face. <laughs> yes. Um, fashion. Let's go with the fashion part because the great thing about this man and his love for fashion was not his own fashion. I mean, first of all, he was impeccably dressed and he would wear these wonderful outfits and you're just like, you know, I coveted these things. I'm like, where did you get that from? Where did you find that wonderful little bow tie and that, that great vest? Where? His appreciation of that was born of his love for for art. That was that was as much of an art that he created as much as anything he drew on a page. But the real art born in that was that he shared that with other people. I saw him see someone wearing something that was really great, some beautiful cosplay, some amazing outfit, and he would take the time to go to them and bring out his camera and take a picture of them. And the appreciation and the love that was born from that made them happier. 
you can see someone's con, their, their, their experience at these events become even better because they were appreciated by this person. And moreover, he would then share that with the rest of us. You'd go to his Facebook feed, and there'd be all these pictures of these beautiful people that he had captured with that camera of his. So the aesthetic, the beauty of this man, first and foremost, for whatever your experience may have been, I've never met anyone who came to me with a cross word about him. Nothing bad to say about him at all. A decent, wonderful person that, again, for most part, most people's experience with it, my own personal one was, wow, who was that guy? What a really great person he is. But it's an appreciation, it's a love. It, it, it was a deep passion that was born of the art he created and the life that he lived. Hugh Batten Lash, and to the wonderful art you created. Thank you. Okay, we're fine. That was very well said. Thank you so much. And you're absolutely right. The way that Batten dressed was an art form um, for him. It all went hand in hand with his interest in, in visual aesthetics and, and presentation. Anna, can I just add one thing about the fashion? Absolutely. And, and it wasn't about money. Plenty of rich men can buy, you know, fancy clothes, and people say, oh, they're impeccably dressed. We bat and it was about style, and that is something money cannot buy. That's right. Yeah, he would find things in all different places and, and bring them together in an outfit that, that nobody else could have assembled, probably. Yes. Uh, and yeah, so that can seem like a surface kind of thing to talk about, but I think this gentleman just put it into a really nice context for us. And his love of socks, he always had the book on socks. Yes, him and hmm. that's right. And he would also, as as we just heard, also um, go out of his way to uh, to compliment other people and to bring them into into and that the world. Shoes. <laughs> the shoes. The um, shoes. We have a little bit of time left. Is there anybody else who'd like to uh, speak about Batten at all? Please introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Mark Habegger. Um, I haven't known Jackie and Batten very long. Um, met them at the very first Comic Fest, so seven years ago. But I felt like I had to get up here and represent my son, Jack Habegger, who is a cartoonist, who's off at school. Um, he's up in uh, Olympia, Washington, going to school for cartooning. And he was mentored by Batten in a very special way. And I don't think a lot of people here know that Batten was um, interested in teaching people and prolonging what he knew through the next generation of artists. He, um, you know, there's not a lot of kids in here right now, but Jack definitely would have been here. So I felt like I had to get up and, and mention that when Jack started his, his character, um, early on I would take him to Comic-Con and I would find mentors for him and I would curate these people. and. Uh, people who were interested in talking to a kid about cartooning. And he, he was about eight when I first started taking him to come. Um, he was 12 when he met Batten. And Batten was one of the very first cartoonists who found him. I would take him and meet cartoonists. Uh, Sergio and Scott and a lot of the guys who were here have been great mentors for him. But Batten came up to me at the very first fest and said, I just met your son, and he's amazing. And, you know, I think he's amazing. I love hearing that. But it really sparked something in Jack. And Batten's friends became Jack's friends, and they became mentors for him. So much so that when we were looking for schools, and Jack had to go to SVA and, and take a look, um, I'm glad he didn't end up there personally, but that was uh, one of the places he wanted to look. We were in the, uh, the village looking at a record store after we had been on the SVA trip. and.